Welcome back to Show and Tell. I'm Billy, and I'm coming to you from my ninth floor apartment in Manhattan. Today, I'm going to be sharing with you the winners of the drawing for the Shetland Wool Week Bonnie Isle Fair Isle hat pattern. I have two copies. I'm also going to tell you about my works in progress, and I'm going to bring you up to date on my comings and goings. So first of all, let's, let's deal with the elephant in the room. Last time I told you I was tasked with completing a sweater that was started by my friend's elderly mother who now has macular degeneration and can no longer see to knit. So this pattern is called Alpine. She had completed one front and the back. I did the other front. And right now the two sleeves are on blocking mats. As soon as these are fully dry, I'm going to be easing them into the arm side. Once again, I struggled with the sleeves. I followed the pattern precisely. And when I was done, I just wasn't seeing that the sleeves were fitting in. So I reduced the length of this strap and reworked the sleeve just a little bit to make it a little bit wider. And now I think they're going to fit just perfectly. After the sleeves are in, there's still more to be done on this sweater because there's some kind of a neck band that goes around. And I think there's meant to be a button with a loop here. There's no buttonhole in, in the pattern, but I think there's meant to be some kind of closure. Right now, I just have my darning needle holding the left front and the right front together. It's a cute little sweater, short sleeves. Really easy knit because it's on a, a much larger needle than what I normally knit with. I think it's on a size eight. And you know me, I'm usually on twos and threes. This project also is on a big needle. These are on number eights US. Um, this is a sweater that I began knitting for my son. And I often talk about not having stash. The only stash I have are leftovers from previous projects. This sweater is going to be knit entirely from leftovers. It seems like in the last year or so, I've been knitting a lot of things with greens and blues. So it kind of worked with this Lang sock yarn, which I have quite a bit of since I timidly over ordered to make sure that I didn't run out for a different project for my son. You'll recall that I knit him a balaclava, a scarf with an interesting texture and a pair of mittens with flip back top to reveal the fingers. So I have quite a bit of this. And for some of this sweater, I'm holding it double, but pretty much the entire pattern calls for two strands of fingering held together. So I'm marling it with a variety of other yarns. This, this one is the solid olive green, and this is the main color that I just showed you. I also have yellow and I have a mint green. I have a bunch of solid colors that I'm mixing in and out. So each one of the welts is a different combination. Here it's solid. So I, I had to use more than two strands because this is a cobweb weight. But in essence, that would have been two strands of fingering weight yellow. And here, same thing with the mint. This is solid mint. But here I've marled an acid green with the mint green. And here I've marled the olive green with the mint green. I'm really trying to use up these cones, which are left over from my Genie project that had seven other colors. I have a lot of each of them left over, but I thought these two colors worked well with the story that I was telling here. So last time I only had a few of the welts done. Now I've completed the welts on both shoulders. And this was interesting to do, not only the technique involved, but also the colors. I had to measure off the specific amount when I was doing one side so that I would have the same amount and same combination for the other side because I really wanted these to match these exactly. 
same story here in the front. This side is done separately from this side. Here I didn't do as good a job because this Lang yarn is constantly changing. Sometimes it's blue, here it's yellow with brown, sometimes it's an olive green. It's always, it's a self-striping yarn, so it's always changing. So to get the exact combination here as I did here was just gonna be too much bother. So it is at least the same yarn and here, same yarn combo as over here. Now I'm on even footing. It's one row all the way across, but over here it was like back and forth to do this side, back and forth to do this side separately. And now they're being connected. The pattern calls for mm -hmm. picking up stitches along the welts to work down the back. And there's a very interesting edging that's done. I don't know how that's going to play into the final assembly of this. The dark color you see here is the only yarn that I did purchase for this project. When I was at Rhinebeck for $1, I bought some little odd mini because once I get into the yoke, there's some interesting geometric shapes and I wanted those to pop. So I wanted to have a, a really different color that would stand apart from all the rest. So I've made quite a bit of progress on this. It's pretty fascinating, but you do have to pay attention at least in the beginning because some of these rows are knit, some of them are pearl. It has a really interesting texture. This texture will end when the yoke ends. And then I think it goes into stockinette for the main part of the body. So this is motoring along very rapidly. I think it's really interesting looking, not vintage. I'm sorry for my vintage fans, but it's also not for me, it's for my son. These are welts that you see here. There are actually 13 individual ones in this Stephen West majestic mountain pattern. This is a saddle shoulder. It's almost like an epaulette. So that's the collar. And on one shoulder, you have all of these individual welts. And I'm just beginning to work on the other side. I'm gonna show you how you achieve these welts. So I happen to have 17 stitches on my needle. And I'm just using my Chalgu points without the cord. I have enough cords going on here. I've knit the requisite number of rows and now this is going to get turned under and connected with these. Let me show you how I've been achieving that. This is the point of the needle that I'm working on. So I want to orient this point in the same direction. This is a thinner needle than the one that I'm knitting on. So it facilitates picking up these stitches. And what I'm going to do is pick up 17 stitches along a single row. I'm just going under each one. One at a time. I need to get to the same number, 17. So 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 15. I need to pick up two more. So I'll grab this one and the one at the very, very end of the row.
then I'm going to pinch these two needles together. Flip it around so that the right side is facing me to begin knitting. So these two needles are parallel. And I'll come with the needle that I'm actually going to knit onto. So almost like a three needle bind off, I'm going to go into this first stitch. I'm, I have double strands going through this. So my first stitch is really comprised of two. The first stitch is really the hardest because everything is sort of wobbling around. Get that out of the way. So I'm going through the front loop of this one through the back loop of that because I put the stitches on twisted. And so now I have my needle through those two stitches. I'm going to pick up my working yarn, pass it through the back loop, pass it through the front loop and slip it off both needles. Don't worry, I'm gonna show you that again. The first stitch is really the sloppiest because everything is flopping around. So again, that's through the front stitch, through the back of the back stitch, grab my yarn, pull it through, and pull it through that one too. So here it is. I'm gonna slip it off the front needle and slip it off the back needle. Again, through here, through there, grab my yarn, pull it through, pull it through, and slip those off. I'll keep doing it a few more times. Slip it off that needle, slip it off that needle. Through the front through the second needle, grab my yarn, pull it through, pull it through, and now just carefully slip it off the front needle and slip it off the back needle. You start to develop a rhythm after you've done a couple hundred of these. Let me work across the rest of the row and show you how it looks. The instructions for the pattern do not tell you to use this two needle method. They just tell you to go across a row and pick up one at a time, those stitches in that row. But I thought this organized everything all in one place. And then I could quickly move across the row instead of searching for the stitch each time. I thought this really expedites things. Plus I know that they're all on the same row because I mounted them on the needle moving across that single row. And at this point, I just checked to make sure I've got three on each needle. Good. So I didn't drop anything and I didn't cast on the wrong number on that back needle. Just have one on each needle. Oops, let's get that back on there. Just like the first stitch, the last stitch can be 
tricky because there's not a lot holding it in place anymore. Okay, now I can remove both of those needles. And there I've created a third welt. Welts can be used on cuffs. If you have a sleeve and you want to put a, a decorative cuff on it, it can be used in all different kinds of ways. This is the first time I've seen them used as epaulets going across the shoulder. This is what the back, the underneath side looks like. So it's very smooth, should be very comfortable for the wearer. And there's what it looks like on the side. These are rather deep. You don't have to make your wealth that deep and you can make, depending on how you're using it, you can make them layered. One is longer than the other. So they would be kind of stacked. Up to you. Another project that I'm working on, also in an effort to use up more of these cones from my genie, is a scarf called Ibiza. I've made a little bit of progress on it. I've been more preoccupied with these other two. Um, but since we last talked, I had told you about the new needles, the hexagon shaped needles that I purchased at Rhinebeck. I can't say that it's a huge improvement, but it is somewhat of an improvement over using a very slick metal needle. This seems to grip the yarn a little bit, so I'm not grappling with our, on my stitches sliding around, sliding off. They do kind of stay put. Um, so I've just done maybe a few rows but I can tell the difference. Because this is the entirety of the project, this would be the equivalent of the people who do socks because they say, oh, it's so small, I can take it with me. I can take this with me. I can take it on the subway or on the bus. However, I do need to have access to the pattern because each row of the 32 pattern repeat is completely different and fairly complicated. As you can imagine with the yarn overs and the knit three togethers and so forth. So it's this and this, but it's still fairly compact. Part of the reason why you haven't heard from me in the last week or so is that I've been busy. This year celebrates my 51st anniversary of my high school graduation. At the occasion of our 50th, we were still pretty thick into the pandemic and people did not want to get together over lunch in person. So we postponed for a year. And the date fell just following my birthday. So I thought that was a good occasion to transport myself down to Philadelphia and spend a long weekend there. Here are a couple of pictures from my reunion I thought you might enjoy. My stepsister lives there and she needed my help on Monday. So I spent Friday evening, the whole weekend, and then part of Monday there. This time I had enough time to pop into one of the local yarn shops that I had never visited. It's called Loop. And they were gracious enough to allow me to walk around the shop and do a little film for you. So let me insert some images and the footage here.
this shop has some of the most lovely selection of yarns that I've seen. These are bulky weight. Here you have all sorts of needles. Very well lit. So you can really see the colors. They also do their own dyeing here. So here's some Malabrigo. You're able to see their prices clearly marked. Everything is available on their website too. This is their own line. Hand dyed right here in the Philadelphia shop. So this is their dye space and it's connected to the classroom. There's a class going on right now. I won't uh, be an interloper. There's a big cocoa knits accessories display. Some mohair. You can really see the colors. Moving into heavier weight yarns. Large balls, solid colors. I've never seen that before. There's Noro Silk Garden. And mostly it's the people who are so lovely, the people who work here. I met Bridget today. This trip to Philadelphia also gave me an opportunity to have an overnight visit, like a sleepover pajama party with my childhood friend who lived in the neighborhood of where my reunion took place. It was very convenient. We don't see one another that often because we live so far apart, but we've stayed in touch over these many decades. And it was just really fun to have some good quality time, just the two of us. Her husband was out of town on the business trip for part of the time I was there. So we really had a chance to reconnect, which was great fun. The next thing I wanted to do is the drawing for winners of these two pattern booklets. I'll insert here that random drawing selection and good luck to all the people who commented on the last video. You were all entered into the drawing. The rules were just leave a comment on the previous video and I have already pre-typed in the link to that video and answered their question. So here we go, we'll get the comments and start the selection process. And the winner is Linda. 
Muljari. And I have one more to, to draw. So let's do that again. And mine is 17. We'll grab the comments again and spin the wheel one more time. And Zan Wild. Congratulations to the winners. Please reach out to me with your snail mail address so that I can pop these in the mail to you. I am in the throes of putting together another knit along for my viewers. This time it's going to be a Spencer. If you're not familiar with the term, I believe it's a British term for something that we would call maybe like a camisole. It's knit either sleeveless, short sleeve or long sleeve. It's meant to be worn as an undergarment, although I think it's pretty enough that one might also choose to wear it as a lightweight sweater, but it can be knit in wool, thin weight. And let me, let me put a picture here for you to see what it is. This is what the sleeveless version looks like. This is what the pattern calls for four, five, or seven ounces, depending on whether you're going sleeveless, short sleeve, or long sleeve. And using number 10 and 12 knitting needles, those are the old British sizes. I'll put on the screen what those sizes convert to. And then you need a piece of ribbon because it, it goes through. You can see that the pattern is written for 34 to 36 inch bust. But during the knit along, we're going to work on how you convert it to whatever your bust size is. There will be a fee to participate in this knit along, but I have some interesting idea of what I want to do in terms of a prize this time. I'm working on the details right now, so I will report more in the next episode, but I just wanted to give people a chance to see if this is something that they'd like to participate in drop me a note, comment on this that you're interested and more information will be forthcoming. I'm looking at maybe a December 1st start date because I want to have enough time for people to order their yarn and so on. I'm working on getting you a discount for that yarn, more details to follow. That's a wrap for this week. I'll see you real soon. Toodaloo. Happy knitting everyone.